like birds and things are creeping and crawling, won't trade no more oil for blood. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them poops who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that nuclear power's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. No news. Good morning, Toledo, and good afternoon, Columbus, and hello to those of you listening on the internet, wherever and whenever you are. My name is Joe Demar, and I'm here with my co-host Rebecca Wood. Yes, and we are bringing you. For a Green Future. For a Green Future is a program where we talk about ecology, the environment. We talk about how it affects you and your family, your health, your wealth, your happiness, and your your possibilities. Because the the healthier an an ecology is, the healthier the environment is, the more possibilities you have. Because the more things you can do, the more resources you have behind you. Um, You know, once the ecology is collapsed, there's very little in the way of opportunity in those places where the ecology has collapsed. Um, so, so, but anyway, I wanted to say driving in today, we, Rebecca and I are a little bit out of breath. We just made it to the studio because um, we ran into a few problems. One, Anthony Wayne Trail is closed. There's police with flares blocking it from coming from downtown. And it looks like it, there's flooding and there's, there's definitely black ice on the road this morning. So... Uh, you can be driving along and it's perfectly dry for a long time, and then all of a sudden there's this patch of black ice that you can barely see. So be very, very careful. And some of these puddles are really deep. Some of these roads definitely are, are flooded this morning. So uh, please be careful coming in and if you have to drive today. So anyway, today is January 12th, and uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, some environmental things in the news and we we have a guest lined up Uh, her name is Polly Peterson she's a PhD student at the University of Toledo in environmental science well actually it's in biology but we'll be hearing from her but the first thing I wanted to talk about was some news that happened here in the Toledo area this past week and that was the Trump rally President Trump came to Toledo spoke at the Huntington and I, I have to report, you know, this time he was telling the truth. In, in some some of the venues he's been in, he's claimed that the places were packed and when there were obviously empty seats all over the place. Well, at the Huntington, he was telling the truth. It was packed. The, the people were lined up from St. Clair all around, the, you know, a couple blocks. I would estimate there might have been like 15,000 people lined up um, and they were turning them away they had to lock the doors and and uh, they were turning people away it was kind of interesting because they were turning people away but the people who were leaving didn't tell the people who were still lined up that they weren't yeah. letting people in anymore i thought that was very They're odd a caring bunch they, those folks yeah they just <laughs> walked right past them and you know and people kept trying to go get in. Oh dear lord! And it would have just would have taken a word to say, "Hey, they're not letting people in anymore." Yeah. Well, so saw that. I saw a lot of things. It was a very interesting. Uh, Many of them dismaying. <laughs> yeah, I'm it was very interesting. I, I saw some of them too. <laughs> yeah. So th- there were about, like I say, about fifteen thousand Trump supporters there, but there were, I would estimate, about two hundred or so protesters. They were there right on here on right kitty corner from the Huntington. And they had all kinds of signs. Really all the way over to Erie Street. Okay, great. 
Good. So, you, yeah, I, I had trouble getting through over to that that part. It was all kind of we were all kind of crunched in there. They sort yeah, of yeah. They they had like little tiny designated areas where we were allowed to protest. Yeah. So that we were all kind of stuffed into. So and uh, the tone of the protesters was uh, pretty militant. You know, they were there were a whole bunch of different issues on being shown. You know, abortion rights. Uh, a lot of people protesting war. There were no no a lot of war no war signs, including the the whimsical and bemusing "We vape, we vote" crowd. Yeah, <laughs> nobody really understood what side they were on. Right. I, <laughs> They had kind of a professional air about them. Yeah, they though. did. Yeah, their, yeah. their signs were all, were all identical and clearly machine made. Yeah, very. Yeah, there were a lot, but there were a lot of hand done signs. A lot of really clever ones. Yeah, clever ones. Um, but uh, there was also a, a little where I was. There was this little group of three protesters who were, had uh, abortion rights signs, and they was these were all young people, twenties and possibly late teens. And they were just uh, insulting the people in line as they were going by. They were just, you know, calling them names, calling them stupid. And, you know, I don't personally, I don't think that's a, a productive way to engage people. I, I think that. Uh, well, it's ableist for starters. It's ableist and it's classist. Mm-hmm. Well, and yeah, and they were. And their problem ain't stupid. It's that they're mean. <laughs> they're mean and they're desperate. To be fair, you know, well, yeah. they've got so thirsty they'll drink poison. I think. I, I wouldn't. I a lot of them. I wouldn't even call them mean. They're probably really nice people. If you go to their house, they'll probably, right. you know, offer you <laughs> the food out of their refrigerator. You know, but but people with giant blind spots are scarier than mean people. Well, yeah, and that's what uh, that's a point I tried to make. My my protest sign. <laughs> Actually, my protest sign said, hey, Trump, no nukes. Was, uh, my wife helped me with it. It was pretty attractive. That's good. That's that's yeah. an important point to make, I think. Well, yeah, and I, part of the reason I, I made that sign is because when Obama came to Toledo, <laughs> I had a protest sign that said, hey, Obama, no nukes, You because know, it doesn't matter who's in the office. Right. These environmental policies that are being pursued, nuclear and coal and fracking, they're bad policies. And, and it sometimes matters less than you would hope who's in office when it comes to those policies. <laughs> right. So <laughs> so I got I got a brief turn at the at the loudspeaker at that protest. Yay. Um, and so I did not insult the people in line, you know, because they're like the rest of us, even though they are a minority, only about thirty five percent of Americans support Trump. But like the rest of us, they're trying their best you know they're trying to put things together and, and make the right choices and they've made they made a choice which flies in the face of, of logic and reason and science but they they think they're doing it for the best possible reasons so i give them that credit and so when i had the mic and i was speaking to the people in the line waiting to see trump what i what i pointed out was i, I said look we're here in the middle of of January, we've only had one snowfall, and that was back in November. And you're about to go listen to a man who's going to tell you there's no such thing as global warming. And so I would, I asked them. I said, so I'm asking you to please just trust your senses, trust what you actually are personally seeing and feeling more than you trust what this man is about to tell you. You know, always keep that seed of doubt, you know, no matter who the speaker is, no matter who's talking to you. Well, you know, I think the anger is coming from the fact that they're kind of a proven threat to both people of color and uh, people with female reproductive systems. Yeah. Which, you know, it's it's it, they're scary. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're a legitimate threat. And yet, yeah, I mean, at some point, logic has to be used. And I'm going to even say, although this will make some of my younger friends angry, common ground has to be found. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, I understand that anger. I mean, really, I really do understand that anger. It may seem like I, I don't actually have much anger. <laughs> and I, I actually, I really, as a rule, I'm not an angry person. But I understand the anger of this little group of three that were just literally just insulting everybody who was going by on their way to see Trump. And and I didn't stop them. 
I mean, some might say I should have tried to intervene and t- tell them not to, but there is so much anger right now among the, amongst the people that are trying to protect our rights and protect the planet that, that. Well, okay. The thing is, you know, when you go insulting working class people and you know accuse them of being Trumpies just because they're working class, who's who's at this point? Our biggest bulwark against Republicans, kind of unions. Mm-hmm. So, and you know, <laughs> these are the same people who like to hunt and fish and crap. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, except unfortunately, remember in the last election, the UAW endorsed Trump. Oy vey. And that was that was, in my opinion, that's why he took Ohio. Yeah. Because um, that was a tremendous shift. And now. Yeah, that was a good idea. But now the polling this time around, right now, um, you know. Trump is way down in the polls in Ohio. Right. So if the if the election were held today, um, it's like an eight point difference. Trump, it's like Trump versus anybody else, uh, and anybody else would take Ohio right now. So, so these fifteen thousand people lined up, they showed up. You know, they they were there to support Trump. Um, but it's important to remember that even though there were only two hundred protesters and fifteen thousand Trump ralliers. They actually represent the minority. They they're much less than half, and around the country they're only about a third. In Ohio they're much less than half, and in, around the country they're only about a third of the people. Yeah, the thing is, you know, I'm a low income person. I'm deep Midwest. I have relatives who farm. I have relatives who hunt buck. You know, mm-hmm. I don't want to do those things. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, uh, on the one hand, insulting those people based on their socioeconomic status, I think is not the way to go. You know, it's Definitely destructive. Yeah. Yeah. On the other hand, it's like if if you've decided that your economic progress can only depend on on someone else not making progress, then or that, you know, any, any time that. So things aren't going well with you. It's 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 the fault of someone lower down on the on the socioeconomic scale. It's the fault of other oppressed people. Then I think you, you've already lost. You know that's a bad tactic. Mm. That's a tactic that got us where we are today. Well, when you yeah. buy that stuff, nothing good happens after that. You know. Right. Well, the reason I oppose Trump and the, the the same reason I opposed Obama on so many of his policies is environmental. I mean that's. That's where I'm coming from. And there, so, there are many good reasons to oppose Trump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yours is among them. <laughs> yeah, there there are, but um, but I I wanted to make the point that we are all, and this was actually the most poignant thing that happened at this rally. They they had the Trump people who couldn't get in. They were in front of the Huntington, and then they had this uh, no man's land, which was full of. Uh, camera tripods and police i don't think there were actually any cameras i think they just sort of put that no man's land there to divide the groups and then there were the anti-trump protesters and at one point the trump the trump people started chanting usa usa and then the anti-trump people started shouting usa usa (laughs) and so you know it would just it's a reminder that we're all Americans, so yes, we can all want the USA. We can all promote our country. We can all support America, and we don't have to support particular politicians in order to do that. So, um, all right. So, anyway, this whole idea that you that uh, that you can just deny science. I mean, that's a very seductive political philosophy. That you can just uh, simply by declaring it, by saying there's no such thing as global warming, pretend that there isn't and put policies in place as if there isn't. And um, so I, for today's guest, and this is a, another pre-recorded interview because uh, it's hard to get people to wake up at <laughs> to interviews at 8 in the morning on Sundays. And so I applaud our audience for, for being awake and listening, those of you that are listening live. Yay for you. And and for those of you listening live, any of you can call in at 866-240-1065. That's 866-240-1065 at any time, and we will happily take your call. Um, were you at the Trump rally? Were you there to see Trump, or were you there to pr- protest Trump? Um, what do you think of his environmental policies? One interesting thing that happened to me is I got there about 5 o'clock, and I started at the end of the line 
of the Trump people, and I actually was walking on the sidewalk alongside that line for almost the whole length of the line with my Hey Trump, No Nuke sign. And there were a few people that shouted, Oh yeah, nuke, nuke uh, Iran, but there were actually more people who said, Hey, I don't like nukes either. Yeah, good. <laughs> Glimmerings <laughs> of sense. Right, and I'm like, part of me wanted to stop and engage them and say, Okay, so you don't like nukes, but you Supporting your a president, president likes them a lot. Like them. Yeah, but I didn't do that because that was good. But but you know, it just goes to show. Yeah, there is a lot of common ground. Most people, most people, even most Trump supporters, understand there is such a thing as global warming. Wow. Um, it's just they, you know, it's just for somehow they they. Well, anyway, so uh, we have uh, we may have a caller. We may have a comment coming in, but I wanted because. Science is so important in policy making and in law making. Uh, today's interview is with a, a woman named Polly Peterson, who is a budding scientist. She's on her way to getting a PhD. And uh, well, we had a, a call or maybe a comment, but yeah. Uh, and so, anyone else welcome to call in during the interview? Eight six six two four zero one zero six five. We'll we'll pause the interview and get you on the air. Um, so. I think it's ready. We'll go right to the interview with Polly Peterson. Polly Peterson, welcome to For a Green Future. Um, Polly is a student at, she's a PhD student at the University of Toledo in the ecology department. She's studying biology with an environmental sciences focus. Uh, Polly, welcome to For a Green Future. Thank you very much, Joe, for having me on. My pleasure, my pleasure. Um, yeah, I wanted to have you on, Polly, because I think that people don't really understand the concept of ec ecological or environmental science, the idea that we have a science which pulls all the other sciences together, uh, like biology and ecology, or biology and meteorology and chemistry. Those all factor into ecology. And now you are in a very particular sort of technical vein of the ecological sciences, you are into the analysis of uh, data, environmentally speaking. Could you just tell us a little bit about that? Yes, my interest is a lot in dealing with numbers. Um, I like to do some number crunching, and so I'm interested in understanding ecological patterns by looking at at the data um, and doing statistical analysis and modeling with that. So that is the focus of what my advisor does at the University of Toledo explicitly, is to do um, mostly Bayesian statistical analysis. So to me, I am a numbers person, and that's where I like to get information about the world and about patterns and systems and what's happening, is I want to see um, collections of data from various sources brought together um, to tell me a story, uh, uh, you know, on a bigger picture, bigger layer of what's happening. Um, so I know sometimes those numbers are a little bit hard for some people to digest, and that's part of what people in my department or under my advisor are trying to do is make those number stories more digestible, um, more understandable for, for everybody, um, scientists and lay people. Okay, well, that that's certainly an important goal, especially when we're in a situation now where we have to make policies and decisions. We we can't just sort of assume the whole the environment's just going to take care of itself now, and we could do whatever we want because what we're doing impacts the environment, and so especially decision makers have to have some clear idea of what the things we do to the environment, what effect they have on the environment, and. Uh, you say Bayesian analysis. Uh, I was looking it up, and I, I was trying to sort of describe it in in a layman's terms. I, I guess that just means really taking the data that you've had in the past and you statistically analyzing it to look for patterns so that maybe you can make some predictions about what is going to uh, – things might look like in the future. And uh, I was thinking of an example, and it's like what they do with the hurricane tracks, right, where they – they have that line where the hurricane's been, that's a solid line, and then we know where the hurricane is, and then you've got sort of a cone expanding out to show where it could be going. 
uh, based on statistics and based on probabilities. Is that is that a good description? I think that's um, a decent a- analysis that most people would understand based on you know just watching the weather. So yeah, uh, Bayesian statistics works entirely with probabilities and distributions of data, not just a single not trying to identify just a single value because ecological systems are so complex and change and vary so much of the time that a lot of times our best bet is just to get a handle on what a range of possible outcomes for a situation could be uh, as the as the ecosystem changes or as the species population changes or as the the lake environment changes so it's good at identifying what's a most likely outcome and then what are some other possible outcomes that are less likely. Right. And so you mentioned the, the lake, and uh, we're, we're going to come back to that in a, in a minute. But uh, when I studied ecology back in the 80s in college, they were, they were really starting to get into this kind of statistical analysis. And uh, they were having some problems with the modeling. I mean, the the classic was the question: Do uh, snowshoe hares eat bobcats? Because what they, when they would look at the snowshoe hare population and the bobcat population, their predicted values for the populations were actually the reverse of what they actually observed. But I imagine that the the science and the the uh, the field has come a long way in 30 plus years. Um, I would say it has definitely. We've gotten, for one, a lot more, a lot better ability to collect data. Um, so that's one piece of this is you have to have people out there measuring and getting the measurements and getting the numbers in order to analyze them to understand what kind of story is being told. So the more data that we've been accumulating over decades, the better quality we have in putting in putting into our models, so that that is a big boost. The um, uh, in a lot of areas of ecology, Bayesian analysis has become more common and more popular um, because it is well suited for again this idea where we have a we have a pretty good picture of of what is happening in our system, in an ecological system, just sort of intuitively. So we can start at that baseline and then utilize our additional measurements, field measurements and data to improve and update um, and modify what we what we know about the system going into it initially. So it's like this continually updating process um, as we gather more data over the years or the decades. So that has helped to increase the accuracy um, and flesh out, a, you know, a wider understanding, flesh out better what is happening in in our range of systems. Yeah, that's great. And so, yeah, I, I think when most people hear ecologists, they're thinking about somebody in, in khakis with maybe wearing boots and out there taking selfies with, with dolphins and, and uh, iguanas and things. But, but you're actually looking at more of a hard statistical data analysis situ- situation. Um, yes, entirely. I um, I call myself a fair weather ecologist, as much as I love the environment and I do love being outside and hiking and camping and kayaking and those sorts of things. Um, I, I'm not the best if I if I have to be outside collecting data in adverse conditions. It just doesn't make me very happy. And I <laughs> I am a non traditional PhD student in that I'm quite a bit older than the rest of my peers. So I'm at, at this point I'm very happy sitting in front of the computer, um, tapping away at the keyboard and, and making my programs do magical things with, with the data that other people bring me. All right. Well, I mean, that's definitely necessary. If, we're gonna, if we are going to understand these complex systems, somebody's got to crunch the data. So I'm, I'm glad you're in there doing that. Um, so let's go to a little more specific on, on where what sort of research you're looking at getting into. Um, and you mentioned Lake Erie, and so there's uh, a lot going on, as people know, with algae blooms in Lake Erie. Uh, what, how are you looking to use data to help us understand what's going on in that big, complicated system that is Lake Erie? 
So my focus for my dissertation work will be lake related since that is a uh, big big issue in the area obviously and there's money um, involved you know to be given for grants to do that kind of research to try to remedy that problem so I will be doing sort of a a three-part dissertation project is the plan at this point where all three parts kind of focus on different phases of um, the, the algal bloom, prop, bloom problem in the lake. And so I will be starting with looking at the agricultural phosphorus runoff and trying to understand how effectively conservation practices are at holding back phosphorus onto the farm fields. Um, so these would be things like grassed waterways and um, winter cover crop, uh, riparian buffers, um, stream, stream side buffers, those sorts of things. So I'm uh, working with some uh, researchers who do field measurements out of OSU and going to be u utilizing their data and then f um, and model doing my modeling with that. And then from there looking at when the phosphorus does get into the lake, because obviously we're um, we've got an overabundance of that. So trying to understand um, through um, data from the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab and EPA, um, what, what the dynamics are with the um, pr productivity, we'll just put it that way um, to simplify it, with the uh, productivity of the phytoplankton and some of that being the microcystis in the lake. So. Uh, th that's a little bit muddy yet, but still trying to iron out some of what's happening on that level. And then going from there to understand the level of toxicity in the microcystin, the toxin part, um, there's some concerns that uh, my advisor and some other people have over about the measurement methods that are used in determining the level of toxicity. And so the plan is to utilize some um, data from from NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, um, to go back and reevaluate many years worth, well, uh, almost a decade worth of data to understand the changes in the um, toxicity and try to get a better handle on just how um, just just how the level of toxicity is measured in determining the how severe it is in Lake Erie. Okay, well, that's a that's a great answer, and I, I think that um, people, you know, when you say microcystin, that's what they call the blue-green algae, which, of course, it's actually a bacteria, but that's what was blamed for shutting down Toledo's water supply uh, a few years back and uh, put Toledo on the map and, and not in a good way. Those bacteria are always there, that that's part of the normal uh, distribution. There's the, there's the phytoplankton in, in a lake. There's many many different kinds and many many different species. And there's both algae and there's things that eat the algae, little microscopic critters that eat the algae. But when you refer to the phosphorus, one of the things that ha can happen with too much phosphorus is it throws that the normal distribution of those populations way out of whack. And extra phosphorus favors this microcystin, and that's what causes the problem. So I'm glad you're looking at possible solutions there. Um, you were, my, my favorite is, you mentioned, riparian buffers. That, that basically just means putting uh, trees, you know, a strip of trees between the, the streams and the drainage ditches and the farm fields. And in my experience, those have all, that has all kinds of benefits, in ter not just stopping runoff, but it also provides habitat for birds and, and uh other critters, and so I, I hope your research will find that uh, it's a very good solution, and I hope you know it's something we'll end up doing. But uh, on a on a personal level, what made you decide to go into ecology to pursue a PhD? I know it's a huge commitment of time and energy and resources, and what drew you to to ecology as your as your PhD subject? Mm, that has been an interest of mine for. Most of my adult life, um, my background, I, I like to say that my background from my bachelor's degree to my master's, and then I also have a another graduate certificate in sustainability, 
Um, I was really studying this idea of sustainability and balance in systems before there was a word that we knew as sustainability, that the way we use it now. Um, so that was a, an interest of mine back in undergrad when I was at BGSU back in the early 90s. Um, so environmental concerns have been high on my list of, of personal priorities um, for many, many years. So I was um, teaching, adjunct teaching for a while locally here um, with my master's degree and then realized, you know, after some things changed in my, in my personal life, I realized I I did have the time and the, and the bandwidth to put into going back and getting my PhD, which is something I had been thinking about for probably close to 15 years and it just hadn't worked out well for timing yet. Um, so that was just, that was my realization was that I wanted to continue to teach and also do consulting work. Um, on, and so I needed, I figured I needed to, um, go ahead and get my PhD to, to go further with that. Um, and I knew I wanted to do it in some realm of environmental concern, policy, ecology, something related to that. And so when I found out that the University of Toledo had a program that, you fit me very well with the ecology, and um, I was able to play with numbers and data at the same time. I was super excited about that. So, well, that's cool. Um, uh, there may be some young people listening. I know a lot of young people today are very concerned about the environment and ecology, who might be considering going into that as a as an academic career or pursuing a degree in ecology or environmental science. Um, what would you say to somebody? Who's considering that? What, how would you say they should prepare themselves? Um, and what what kind of things is it helpful to know going into something like that? Well, one of the things that I appreciate on a personal level about going into an environmental related field is that it is multidisciplinary. And that is how I work. That's how I like to look at systems and problems from many different angles because um, they, the, you know, problems to that degree are rarely anything we can explain with one field of study or one angle or one perspective. So if you're somebody who appreciates knowing a realm of, of knowledge or having a realm of knowledge and knowing a variety of different um, aspects of a problem, you know, biology, chemistry, geology, meteorology, all of those go into environmental sciences, and then you can obviously pick um, a focus within that uh, if you'd like. But there are um, ecologists who are landscape ecologists, which do exactly that, where they look at the broader picture across the a whole landscape or across the whole ecosystem. So there's that possibility, too. And uh, an a number of my peers and colleagues in the program do for focus on specific organisms, um, birds or reptiles, turtles. Um, so that fish is another popular one. Uh, so that that's an option as well. So if you're somebody who does like to go out in the field and play with critters, um, ecology is definitely a way to go with that. I would like to get more people excited about the possibility of analyzing large data sets because we have so much data coming in now with uh, from all different angles and all different fields. People are um, researchers are much more in tuned to understanding that we need to have more measurements. We need to if you cannot understand, you cannot analyze anything that you don't measure. So we're starting to get much better about that. So I would love to see more math mathematically or computer science inclined people who have an environmental or ecological concern in the, you know, in their background to put those two together um, and realize that they can make a real impact. As you were saying earlier, the policy decisions are very much dependent on um, having some solid basis for understanding those relationships and then, re and then knowing how to relate that information from the data to, to the lay people and to the politicians and the policymakers. They need to have people who are good at translating that message as well. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, I think we're just about done here. And so I, I just wanted to say what, what in your study so far has been the thing that has either interested you the most or struck you the most or, or it was the most 
you were the most surprised to learn? Um, I think dealing with Lake Erie in, uh, issues has been a real eye opener in understanding that we have a very special lake for our region, but it is also very unique ecologically, um, and it has to be understood on its own terms. It can't really be um, the systems can't be understood in the lake based on the other Great Lakes. Unfortunately, we need to have a lot more data and analysis of the of Lake Erie specifically because it is so shallow and so warm, and the southernmost lake, um, all of that, uh, and the huge um, agricultural land that uh, is in the watershed, all of that makes Lake Erie very unique. And I want to do whatever I can to help improve our wonderful lake that we have. All right. Well, Polly Peterson, thank you so much for being on uh, For a Green Future. Thank you very much, Joe. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, and it it was a pleasure interviewing Polly. And uh, I wanted to get her on this week in particular because these decisions we make about what we're going to do in relation to the environment, ideally they would be just simple, straightforward, scientific, you know, okay, we put this pollutant into the water, this happens, all right, we're going to regulate that pollutant. And in the, back in the 70s, we were actually heading in that direction. And the because uh, back in the 50s and the 60s, the pollution levels were much, much higher than they are today and on many levels in terms of smog and in terms of uh, biological stuff getting put into waterways. You know, most sewage treatment at that time was just what they call first level sewage treatment, which is literally just a screen that caught the big stuff (laughs) that they would clean off once in a while. I mean, uh, so we were headed for a world where the environmental things were, were apolitical and that's where I actually would, would like to be because I think that once these things start getting political, emotions start getting high. We had a caller as we were talking on the first part of the show who was uh, very worked up, but he didn't want to actually get on the air and talk, which is, you know, I, I'd encourage anybody to call in at 866-240-1065 on any environmental topic. But I, I'm, I just wanted to illustrate a scientist. You know, we hear about these anonymous scientists that declare this or find that. I, I wanted to get an actual scientist on to, to sort of show that, hey, these are real people. Right. <laughs> They're not just these, you know, abstract concepts out there, that, that real people are doing this research, putting the time and effort into finding these. Because they wanted, they want to find out the truth. Exactly. And that's, and that's the basis of it. It's, it's, they want to find the truth, and like Polly, they want to use that knowledge to help the ecosystems that they're studying. So it, I was grateful that she was on. Uh, and I'm also grateful for our sponsor of this hour, uh, For a Green Future, is brought to you by the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They are protecting natural spaces, maintaining quality green spaces, They provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature. They restore wildlife habitats, and they lead outdoor adventures. The Wood County Parks protects 20 parks and nature preserves around Wood County, which are open from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every day of the year. And you can get a hold of people at Wood County Parks by calling 419-353-1897. They also have an app, which you go to the App Store and just download. It's It's just... WC Parks, very easy to remember. And you can go to their website, of course, which is wcparks.org. And I would like to announce some of the amazing things that they're doing. They're always doing stuff at the Wood County Parks. Um, And actually, they have something today from 1 to 3 p.m. at the Bradner Interpretive Center on Fostoria Road in Bradner. It's an introduction to orienteering. Yeah. Yeah. Which uh, which is kind of fun. I did it as a Boy Scout for many years. It basically teaches you how to use a compass to actually find your way around on a map. And uh, yeah, this this was the this was the pre GPS uh, <laughs> system there that you, you can't just ask your compass where to go, but uh, it can tell you where to go if you if you know how to, to listen to it. So that's actually happening today 
uh, one to three at Bradner. And some of the other interesting things that they're doing, uh, they're having a program called Superb Hour, Owls, Superb Owls, and that is Thursday the 16th from 7 to 9 at the W.W. Knight Nature Preserve in Perrysburg. They are going to have an educational program with actual live owls. Ooh. And you go and uh, they'll tell you all about them, and uh, you just register for that at wcparks.org, or you call them at 419-353-1897. And then on uh, this coming Friday, January 17th, from 6 to 8 p.m., again at W.W. Knight Nature Preserve, they're having a kind of fun one. It's called Wild Self-Defense Cougar. In other words, they're going to teach you how to defend yourself against a cougar. Right. I, I think the first thing is, well, I don't, you don't run. Running is not going to work. The cougar's faster than you. Yeah. No, <laughs> running, cougars kind of enjoy it. And yeah, they like run. it when you run. It yeah. says, come eat me to them. <laughs> right. So um, there, you can go and learn all about uh, how to avoid the close encounters with the cougars and, and how to have a chance at defending yourself from, uh, you know, this, the biggest, I think that's, well, the biggest cat in North America. Uh, then, uh, but on a more uh, pedestrian note or a more homey note, then at the they're going to have butternut squash pickling. They're going to teach you at the Carter Historic Farms. That's uh, Saturday, January 18th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Which takes place mostly indoors, so the cougars can't get you while you're doing that, probably. Right. You, usually, Your chances are good. Yeah, usually cougars and squash pickling don't. <laughs> you don't. Th- those two don't often overlap, but. Uh, uh, so that's uh, next Saturday, and then also next Saturday at the W.W. W. Knight Nature Preserve from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m., they're going to have a winter bird count for kids. So, um, yeah, so you get out there and you can count as many birds as possible, and then after the bird count, they will be feasting on pizza and uh, making while well, they tally all the lists up to see how many birds are in, in uh, the Nature Preserve this year. And so that's what's happening this coming week. And then... Uh, the week after that, they're going to be doing. Um, they're going to teach people how to how to mend clothing at the at the Carter Historic Farm. That's called Stitch in Time Saves Nine. Um, and then they're also that following week going to have a program for certified volunteer naturalists. And they're going to have uh, one cool one on the 22nd. It's going to be Escape the Nature Center at the WW Nature Preserve. They're going to turn it into an escape room, a, a nature-themed escape room. So, um, and then they're going to tip on the on Thursday, the 23rd. They're going to teach winter survival. They're also going to on Friday, the 24th. They're going to teach fire by how to build fires in the winter. On Saturday, the 25th, they're going to have an open archery, a winter archery, Arctic archery, they call it. And then uh, on also on Saturday the 25th, they're going to have a seed cleaning marathon because they have uh, greenhouses that grow native plants at, every year, and so they have to get the seeds nice and clean before they distribute them or plant them. So, all right, so get yourself on out to the Wood County Parks. So now, in addition to our sponsors, uh, we also have patrons, uh, patrons that we're very grateful for. And, Russell? And we have new sponsors, too, don't we? That's why we have the trumpet music. Yay! Let's hear it again. There we are. And we want to welcome our new sponsors, Shannon and Clayton. And uh, they, like others, have simply gone to patreon.com and searched for For a Green Future on Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And then they were able to sign up at, uh, you know, to make a monthly donation. Very quick, very easy. You won't even notice it month to month, but we notice it and we appreciate it greatly. So, um, if you're interested in becoming a sponsor for a green future, just go to patreon.com. And right. be like Shannon and Clayton. Yes. <laughs> be cool. Yeah. Shannon and Clayton. Not just, you know, they are cool people. So they we are. thank them very much. And we thank our continuing sponsors, our pre, our sponsors already. So we, we're, we're building, we're growing. And, uh, one actual sign of that is that this first week in January, our show for a green future was in the top 50 
uh, in the news podcasts on our Podomatic uh, podcast program. Ooh. And that's the top 50 out of literally thousands of podcasts. So uh, thank you very much for those of you that listen on the podcast, downloading it and, and listening to it as a podcast. You kept us right up there in the and, and we're still, you know, we we slipped a little bit this past week. We're down to about a, in the top hundred, but we're still we're doing really well. So people are listening, and we appreciate it. And uh, so we have a responsibility to people because they're listening. And and we had a little side conversation last week that that took us in a lot of directions. And there were there were some things we said and statements made that I. I wanted to go back and, and revisit because uh, I wanted to make sure our listeners have the accurate picture about things. We started talking about uh, the koki, which is the, the tiny little frog. It's about it's one of the smallest frogs there is, actually. It's about the size of a dime. I think it makes a lot of noise for its size, though. It does. It's, it's, <laughs> it, it, it's named after its call. It sounds yeah. like koki. <laughs> and it actually has a really high-pitched call. It's literally at the limit of human hearing, which wow. is interesting. But uh, we were, we had said that it was uh, extinct. Well, in Puerto Rico, which is its native area, which is not exactly true. Um, there were 17 species of koki, mm-hmm. and three of them are listed as extinct. Ah. Um, and those are the the mountain koki. But the lowland populations are stable. But in 2012, they were listed as an endangered species. Okie dokie. So they're getting endangered species protection. And that uh, is helping, you know, so far 99% of the species that go on the endangered species protection survive. So there are still cokies in Puerto Rico. So I want to be clear about that. And, and then we started talking about slime mold, <laughs> <laughs> which... Uh, I didn't bring that up. I'm pretty sure. It was Joe. Blame yeah, Joe. Yeah, it was me. <laughs> and once again, I, I think I did mention last week that if you study ecology, you're constantly learning new things and you're constantly being humbled. Well, when I studied, first learned about slime mold, it was actually classified as a fungus, as a fungi. Uh, It has since been reclassified as a protista because, you know, I I talked about how weird it is that it's like this mold that can pull itself together into like a slug and that, that that then crawls around, which is very strange. And so, but people used to think it was a fungus, but now they realized that that slime is actually millions of individual amoeba that have joined themselves together into one organism so that their nucleuses actually float around free. So this big patch of slime mold is actually like a single cell with thousands of nucleuses all just floating around and, and, until it starts to get dry and then they say, oh, We've got to make a slug, and then they pull themselves together. In so, times of crisis, they work together, yeah. So it's not a fungus, it's a protista. So isn't that kind of how jellyfish got started? Because I, if I remember my, my high school biology right, isn't a jellyfish just kind of a collection of single cells and somehow not actually an animal that just decided to hang out together somehow? No, no, no. jellyfish have crossed the line. They okay. are multicellular organisms. But they're very close to being a slime mold. But they're <laughs> very close <laughs> to, to like selps. Selps are what it's called a selps, a colonial organism, which is wow. like you say, just individuals that have sort of come together to make a thing that looks like a, a single creature, but it's actually a right. So, um, but no, jellyfish are actual organisms. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so there we go off on another tangent, which probably I'll have to correct next week. But, um, but one thing about fungi that you had said and. And here's the tying together is that one of the reasons koki and other frogs are threatened is because of a fungus. It's called Uh-oh. chytridiomycosis, um, and uh, that is killing frogs and other amphibians all over the world right yeah. now. Um, but fungi, you had said they're they're like animal-like. Yeah. Well, yes, they they, which is why fungus fungus also used to be in the plant kingdom. But now they've separated them out. So now it's like plants, animals, fungus, protista. And the reason they're considered like animals is that they, their cell walls have store food, or they're, they're, they store food as glycogen, which is just exactly the way we do it. Our livers are full of glycogen, and fungi are full of glycogen, like an animal. <laughs> and their cell walls have chitin, chitin. 
chitin, C H I T I N, uh, chitin. I'm sorry, they have their, their cell walls have chitin in them, the same way that insect skeletons and lobsters and other arthropods have chitinous skeletons. Fungi also have chitin, so that's an animal. Plants don't have it. And what's up with lichens? Okay, aren't lichens like sort of half fungus, half some kind of plant thing? Yes, they yeah, are. Yeah, I remember this too. Because I, I said last week that um, fungus were uh, saprophytic, which means they like break stuff down and decompose it. Right. Well, actually, fungus. some fungus are saprophytic. Many of them are. But others are symbiotic. They're symbiotrophs. And so lichen is an example of that where... The fungus makes a colony with algae, and together they both strengthen each other, and they both give each other different nutrients. And and so lichen as does much better than either the separate algae or the separate uh, it's fungus. It's sort of does. a collaboration between two different organisms. Right. Yeah. And then some fungus are also parasitic, like the chytridiomycosis, which are affecting frogs, and and so. I used to like biology in school because a lot of it sounded like science fiction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's really interesting. Yeah, they do. I mean, <laughs> wait, starfish? What? That can't be true about the, with the arms and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, regrowing. Right? Yeah, yeah. No, it, it. That is one of the reasons that I, I find ecology so fascinating. Yeah, because it's it, true. A lot of it is like that can't be true, but, <laughs> but yeah, is, they yeah. really do that. Um, but speaking of science fiction, <clears throat> not that this is, but uh, every week we get a letter from the future. Ooh. Yes, from my uh, great-great-granddaughter, Marie I. And so here is this week's letter. Dear great-great-grandpa, something is terribly wrong here on the Mars colony. Those cultures I made of the soil around the main colony shocked me. We have long known that there were three different kinds of Earth bacteria on Mars. They came over on the Viking landers. But my culture showed 20 different kinds of earth bacteria plus two kinds of fungi. It looks like someone is deliberately trying to plant earth organisms on Mars. I haven't told anyone yet, not even my brother Sam. I'm pretty sure no one even knows that these cultures are mine. Since I haven't been scheduled, I haven't had any official lab time scheduled, I've been coming into the lab and checking on on my cultures after hours. This is an incredible breach of scientific ethics. It's folly to think that we can just rush around and terraform a planet without scientific study and debate about how best to do it and how we can preserve the Martian microorganisms while we do it, even as we introduce new ones into the environment. There were hardly any Martian microbes in the samples that I checked. Now, it's possible that the problem was with my sampling. I may have accidentally contaminated the samples, but I don't think so. I was very careful, but I'm not ready to tell the world about this until I can confirm it. The official reason I'm here at the Carson base on Mars is to evaluate their deep Mars drilling project. They've been claiming that there are no deep Martian microbes the way that there are on Earth. Now I'm suspicious. In fact, I'm suspicious of everyone. There's been no word in the scientific literature about these new bacteria and fungi being introduced to Mars If this is deliberate, there's some kind of huge cover-up happening. I'm scheduled to go back to the main settlement next week. I'm going to talk to Bill Ryderson, the head of the colony, about this and demand lab time and careful sampling and study. Wish me luck. Wow. Love, Marie I. Wow, Wow, it's turning into an action thriller. Yeah, things are getting kind of... There may be exploding helicopters soon. (laughs) Well, helicopters are a little hard on Mars. Yeah, so. not very much air, yeah, I think. But there, there may be explosions. I don't <laughs> yeah, know. There, yeah. Well, hopefully she just comes out of this okay. But. And everybody's like, oh, gee, okay, you're right. We should have done that. We'll stop now. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. Maybe reason will prevail. Who knows? Uh, Every once in a while it happens. So, well, speaking of reasoning prevailing, um, some interesting news out of Australia. Uh, we have been talking about the Australian wildfires for quite a while here on For a Green Future and about the climate-denying Prime Minister of Australia who, uh, as the smoke was choking Sydney, moved his family off to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, the interesting news is that he has now come out and officially said, okay, yes, I admit it, there is global warming. Um, (laughs) But he's not going to actually change any of his policies. You know, Australia is still the largest coal exporter 
one of the largest coal exporters in the world. He's not going to mess with that. Um, so this is a this is something politicians do. Is you know, I mean, essentially what they're saying is, yeah, okay, I'll admit the car is driving towards the cliff. Yeah, um, but. I'm not going to break. <laughs> I'm not going to steer. Yeah. You know, you're right. We're our head, we're heading for a cliff, but I'm just going to keep driving the way I always drive because this is how I drive. So um, not even going to ease the foot off the old gas pedal. <laughs> no, nope, nope. it's like pedal to the metal. Yeah. Um, so that that was a, a little interesting update that I, I wanted. To I think he may that. have been a, a jerk beyond what corporate money can even buy public opinion out of. Hmm. Well, that's interesting that you bring up the corporate because there's been a study done that essentially Rupert Murdoch, you know, is is Australian and he has he owns tons of news organizations in Australia. I mean not just the major newspapers but also lots of TV stations and radio stations and and um he personally his holdings they're all working together to help the prime minister. They're blaming the Australian wildfires on arson, which only about 3%, yeah. you know, 97% are starting naturally from lightning and their causes. But they're blaming, they're trying to blame it all on arson. They're trying to say, oh, it's not so bad that he took his family off to Hawaii. People do that all the time, you know. Uh, so, again, the politics, the, eco- the economics, it's all tied together. But bottom line, the earth is needs our help and we we should help it. We need to get off of carbon, period. So, on that note, we will end the show. This is Joe DeMar. And Rebecca Wood. Signing off. I don't want them nukes. Run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit. Give us all we need to make this country run.